Thanks, Shannon. Hi, ladies. How are we this morning? Is everyone doing? Oh, that was kind of, oh, uh, are we in a food coma? <laughs> this sounded like we were in a bit of a food coma, but those crepes were amazing, were they not? Can we thank our food committee one more time? Well, we, uh, as the women of Compass Bible Church Teston, if you are here as a guest this morning, we are so thrilled that you could join us this morning. Um, and it's a very special day for us because not only is this our second annual Christmas and Crepes, which is really exciting that we're on starting year two of all of our traditions, but it also is really the beginning of the Christmas season here at Compass Teston. So we are just so thrilled that you joined us this morning, and we definitely hope that you'll come back and come watch our darling children, mine are in it also, um, but <laughs> our darling children perform in our kids' Christmas musical, which is the weekend of the 17th, and then come back, um, don't miss our Christmas Eve services, which I know Shannon has already discussed. But the holiday season is upon us. Who is feeling it already? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Who's decked their halls already? Anyone who's got their tree up already? Just a few. Wow, I thought there would definitely be more than that. Our halls are decked. We're going this afternoon to get our tree. So it is, we are in the full swing of all the Christmas things. But I don't know about you guys, but for our family, the Christmas season always means a lot of being out, right? It's parties, it's time with friends, it's times with family, it's going out and doing our shopping, and we're just out a lot. And so my husband and I find that we have one conversation kind of over and over and over again with our kids during this season. And the moms that are in the room, you may know this one, it's the one where one or both of us parents, as we're pulling into wherever it is that we're going, kind of lean back and give that little side eye and we talk about kind of the expectations that we have and just kind of gently remind or firmly remind about our family rules and about how we've trained them to behave. But honestly, that's a conversation that we have all year long. It just feels like we have it almost on a daily basis <laughs> during the Christmas season. But my kids have really been trained since the time they were little, especially my girls. My girls are 11 and 9, and then we have our 14-month-old boy. And the girls have really been trained since the time that they were able to speak that when we give them a directive or when we ask them to do something, that we want their response to be, yes, mommy, or yes, daddy, without delay. Now, I would be lying... I'd be a big fat liar if I stood up here and told you that they nail that 100% of the time. Sadly, they don't. It's been like 11 years of training. Why is it taking so long? I don't know. But they don't nail it 100% of the time. But when they do, I always have this response to them and they roll their eyes at me. I say, oh, music to my ears. Yes, mommy. When they have a heart that is just ready and willing to quickly obey. I also tell them often that when we hear you say yes, mommy, or yes, daddy, to what we've asked you to do, it is just as good as you saying I love you. Well, this morning, I'm so excited to dive into scripture with you and talk about a gal who had that same kind of response. But rather than saying yes, daddy, to her earthly father, she said, yes, Lord, to her heavenly Father. And as you guys know, I'm sure you've seen what's up there right now, a look at the heart of Mary. We are going to be talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus this morning, and I'm so excited to dive in and really look at what, what was that? How was she able to respond so quickly, so obediently, so joyfully with yes, Lord, when God gave her a pretty big assignment? So we're going to be this morning looking at the gospel of Luke. And Mary doesn't come into the scene until verse 26, so I'm going to do like a quick flyby of what happens in the first 25 verses just to catch us up to speed so that we know where we are. So fasten your seatbelts, get ready, here's the quick bird's eye view. All right, we start the Gospel of Luke and we come to find out that it's written by Luke. And we find out that Luke has been a very diligent journalist. He has gone back to all the eyewitnesses and has come to find out, to be able to write his book, his letter to Theophilus and tell Theophilus in verse four, he says, you can have certainty. I wrote these things so that you can have certainty that the things you've been taught are true. 
So we know that Luke went to the eyewitnesses, the people that were there, the people who saw, heard, taste, felt, experienced all these things firsthand. Then we jump in at Luke 1, 5, and we come to the story of Zechariah, who's an old priest, and his wife, Elizabeth. And we come to find out very sadly that Elizabeth has been barren their entire marriage and that she's never been able to conceive a child. But miraculously, an angel appears to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, Elizabeth, who has been barren, will no longer be barren. She's going to conceive and bear a son, and you are to call his name John. And he is going to be the one, that voice crying in the wilderness, that prepares the way for none other than the Messiah. And Zechariah in verse 18 has a question for the angel. How shall I know this is? And the angel gives him a bit of a rebuke at this point and kind of says, How dare you not believe me? I stand in the presence of God. I came directly from him to tell you what he's going to do, that these things will come to pass, and you haven't believed me. So you know what, Zechariah? You're going to be mute until the baby is born because you did not, you failed to believe, you failed to trust what God was going to do. So sure enough, the angel leaves Zechariah, and the things that he says are true, and they come to pass. Zechariah is unable to speak, he's mute, and we can presume that a couple weeks or a few months later, they come to find out that Elizabeth is indeed pregnant. There it was. We just covered the first 25 verses of of Luke 1, and now we're going to dive in to verse 26, which is where the story of Mary begins. I'm going to read it for you from my Bible. You guys can feel free to follow along on the screens there. This is Luke 1, 26 through 38, and it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I am so excited to dig into this passage of scripture with you ladies this morning because I think that sometimes we can be tempted to just gloss over so many incredible details about this account, or we may be tempted to think of Mary differently than we ought to, how the Bible actually portrays her. So let's hop back into verse 26 and go back to the beginning of that passage, and right out of the gate, there is a ton of information that we can gather here about who was the biblical Mary. In verse 26, it says, in the sixth month, in the sixth month of the year, No, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy that we just learned about. So when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent Gabriel to Galilee, to a city called Nazareth. If you look up here on the screens, I've kind of shown you here where Nazareth is. It's kind of in that pullout where uh, Galilee is, because Galilee is showing you the region there, and then Nazareth um, is kind of up there on the whole map, on the north, in the north region. There it is, Nazareth. You know the thing about Nazareth? It was actually like a really small town. You actually kind of more like a village, really, than a city or anything else. It was very nondescript, kind of this 
unmentionable dot on the map. In fact, there was literally nothing written about it in all of Israel's history until this very moment. You, Nazareth is never men mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in any of you know, Israel's historical documents until now because it was just kind of this tiny, nondescript little town. So that's where we are geographically. Verse 27 says um, that Gabriel came to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Okay, right there, we just read like a handful of words, but there is so much information right there. Let's first of all start with the fact that she was betrothed. Now again, I said that sometimes we may be tempted to think of Mary differently than we ought. And as 21st, women, uh, 21st century women sitting here on the other side of the world, you know, 2,000 plus years removed from this event, we may be tempted to conjure up images in our mind of a 25 to maybe even a 35-year-old woman who is engaged to be married. Maybe we think she's finished high school, she's finished her degree, she's got a few years of her career under her belt. We gotta take that and throw it out the window because we are talking about ancient Israel. And at that time, to become betrothed, to become engaged, to be married, they were marrying those girls off quickly because they were like a farming culture and they needed those hands and they needed those babies to be made to help out with the family businesses. So really, as soon as a girl became ch the age where she could bear children, she was betrothed. Well, now we as ladies, and sorry tech team, but we as ladies sitting here, we know what that means, right? That means that Mary was somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15 maybe even somewhere, probably right around 13 or 14. So we need to take those images that we have in our mind of maybe like a 27 or 30 year old woman sitting there looking serene with a halo over her head and toss that out the window because we are talking about like a junior higher or a young high schooler here. We also find out um, as we study about the betrothal period, that this was as good as a marriage. When they entered into a betrothal, it was really a binding contract between these two families. In fact, it was so binding that in order to break an engagement, one would have needed a certificate of divorce. That's how important the betrothal period was. You would have had to divorce. It's not just a hand back your ring and peace out and call it a day. I mean, this was like legal steps that had to be, take, be, had to be taken in order to break off an engagement. Um, the other thing that we find out about the betrothal period is that it lasted a year long. And that kind of served two purposes. One, it was to really give the young couple who was most likely in an arranged marriage an opportunity to get to know each other. But secondly, it was so that the people could know that the woman or young girl was pure, that she was chaste, that nothing fishy had ever taken place. And so there was this year-long period. And so we find out that Mary is somewhere in this year-long period of having been betrothed to David, or, uh, to Joseph, excuse me. We also find out that she is a virgin, and Luke is so careful to emphasize this multiple times in this account, but in this verse in particular, he emphasizes it twice. He says that she's a virgin betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph, and then he says, and the virgin's name was Mary. He wants it to be very clear that she was pure, that she was chaste, and that nothing fishy had ever happened. The next thing that we find out is that she's engaged to Joseph. And when we go back and we look at all of the Gospels, the other three, in comparison with this, we come to find out that Joseph was a carpenter. And a carpenter in those days was not uh, very high on the socioeconomic ladder. In fact, it was really kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. Joseph was probably fairly poor, which means that Mary was kind of in his same class, and so she was probably fairly poor as well. So now we have where this is happening in biblical history. We have geographically where this is taking place. We have who this is taking place to. Now let's dive in to see this incredible conversation that the angel Gabriel has with Mary. In verse 28 he says, um, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. 
Okay, let's start right there. Greetings, O oh favored one. It's kind of a bummer that in the English language, we don't get the full weight of how it was said uh, in the original language, which is Greek. And the way that that was said is that greetings, God has placed his favor upon you. Not that she in and of herself is full of grace by any merit of her own, but rather God, she as a passive uh, passive member of this transaction, God has placed his favor upon her, and the Lord is with her. In verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Well, first of all, we already know at the beginning of Luke that he went to eyewitness accounts. So we know that this is probably Mary herself retelling this narrative to Luke for him to record for us. She was the one that gave this testimony, this information of what had happened to her. And she says, I was troubled at the saying. Well, it makes sense now to us why she would be confused she is from a nondescript, tiny little place. She is a young teenager um, engaged to a fairly poor man. And an angel appears to her and says, God has put his favor upon you and is with you. I mean, if you were married, you'd be like, oh, but me? What? Are you talking to me? What? What's going on here? You know? No wonder she was troubled at the saying. She was confused. She's trying to figure out, what are, you, what are you talking about? So let's go on. In verse 30, we learn, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Okay, whoa, mind-blowing moment here. Gabriel just announces to Mary, this young girl, that she is going to be the woman to carry the promised Messiah, the promised anointed one, the promised Savior, who all of the Old Testament, all of the prophets, and really all of Israel's history has been waiting for this moment. And now this young girl in this tiny little village finds out, you're going to be the one to bring him into the world. And we know that Gabriel is talking about the Messiah because for those of us who were here last year, we studied a very similar passage that was written in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, hundreds of years before this ever happened. Let's read it together really quick. Uh, this is Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. Wow, that's pretty much exactly what the angel is saying here, right? And of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is the Messiah. This is what they have been waiting for, for centuries upon centuries. And he's about to make his entrance into the world. Verse 37, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth, sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Okay, this is really interesting because if you remember, like we talked about in Luke 1.18, Zechariah had what seems at first like the exact same response, and yet when we dig a little deeper and look at it, we'll see that these two questions that both Zechariah and Mary said to the angel were actually worlds apart. So I'm going to go back really quick and look at it. When Zechariah says, how shall I know this? What does the, what's the angel's response? He rebukes him. He says, basically, shame on you for not believing, and then he t tells him he's going to be mute. That's because Zechariah's question was born out of disbelief. Zechariah's question was born out of a spirit of saying, prove it. That's not going to happen. However, on the 
opposite end of the spectrum, we have Mary, who is very interesting. It's like she immediately understood that what Gabriel was implying to her was that these things were going to happen immediately. But she knows that she's in this betrothal period where she's not having relations with Joseph, so how is that going to happen? Mary's question was not born out of disbelief, but out of genuine curiosity. And we know this to be true because of the way that Gabriel then responds to her by legitimately answering her question and explaining to her what is going to take place. So he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Again, there it is. This is fulfillment of prophecy. Again, we go back to the book of Isaiah because in Isaiah 7:14 it says, "Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel." Remember what Isaiah wrote was like hundreds and hundreds of years before this ever took place in this tiny little town of Nazareth. This was the fulfillment of prophecy. And Gabriel tells Mary that her child is going to be called holy, different, set apart, perfect, unlike anyone else because he's the son of God. He goes on to say nothing is impossible with God, and of course nothing is impossible with God because he's the creator. He's the omnipotent creator. He doesn't need the male contributor to be able to create life in Mary's womb and in fact says, I'm not going to use that. I am going to create life inside of you without a male contributor. And so this child will be called the Son of God. And then we arrive at Mary's response to the angel. In verse 38, she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Sometimes I think that for us, it's so easy for us to just quickly read past that. And we're almost in one aspect like anticipating that Mary is going to say that because we've read it so many times. But I think we need to pump the brakes for a second and stop and realize what this meant for her to say that she's the servant of the Lord and she's ready to take on this enormous assignment. See, for those of us who are in the room that are moms, whether that happened naturally or through adoption or however it is that God grew your family, there is a moment in every mother's life where they realize, I'm going to be a mom. And for those of us who have experienced that, it's earth shattering, right? It completely changes the way you see everything. It completely changes the way you think about everything. And in that one moment, it's like you have a million thoughts running through your head and you automatically know and understand the weight of how your life is going to change forever because you're gonna be a mom. Mary had that too. Mary experienced that too, just like all women. She understood that by accepting this from uh, God, this special assignment, that she was gonna have the stigma of an unwed pregnancy on her which in those days was way worse than it is today. She didn't know how Joseph was going to respond at that point. Remember when I said that a, a break of a betrothal would require a certificate of divorce, and if she were to be found to be unpure? I mean, that was like horrifying, life-altering, never-recoverable circumstance in a, in a young girl's life. She didn't know how God was going to work that out. That's not the question she asked. That's not the instructions that the angel gave to her. Oh, don't worry. We're, we'll cover Joseph. Don't worry about it. She didn't know that in that moment. She didn't know how her family was going to respond. And to be honest, aside from her relative Elizabeth, who she goes to visit immediately after this, there's really no written account of how Mary or Joseph's families responded when they realized that Mary was with child before the betrothal period was over. So we still don't know what she may have suffered in being obedient to God. Last, in the uh, culture at that time, there were actually laws that would have given people permission to stone a woman if she were found to be impure. impure. Now, that rarely happened, but it was definitely a possibility because it was the law. They could have done that. 
And so when Mary says, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, we need to stop and realize the great cost that didn't cause her to blink or stop for one moment. It's that yes, dad, immediate obedience, joyful obedience. Then what's even more amazing about this is that she says, I am the servant of the Lord. And this Greek word that she uses here for servant is doule, which is the female version of doulos. And it's actually a little bit stronger in the Greek. It's not just servant, it's slave. I am the slave of the Lord. Why would she be willing to submit herself to a Lord that was asking her to take on this this important assignment, but at great personal cost? I think it's because Mary knew who she was saying yes to. And we see that in her song of praise, which is later in the chapter of Luke 1. It starts in verse 46, and it goes all the way to verse 55. And it's one of the most beautiful and eloquent and theologically rich songs in the whole New Testament. Mary had a deep understanding of who God was. And so when he gave her her assignment, she knew who it was that she was saying yes to. And she trusted him to be faithful. And she trusted him to be good. And she trusted that this was his perfect plan for her life. Today and during this busy Christmas season, I fear that sometimes we forget who it is that daily asks us to say yes, to be obedient to him. And so I just want to take a few moments to remind us of four important character and qualities of who God is and why he is the one that we should constantly offer ourselves as the slave to. In Romans, we learn that we're one of two things. We're either a slave to sin or we are a slave to righteousness. There's nothing in between. It's one or the other. So let's see who this God is that calls us to be slaves of righteousness and slaves of him. The first important thing to know is that God is the creator, right? That's where it all starts. And that's where the Bible starts. In the very opening pages of scripture, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God is the creator, then he gets to make the shots, right? He gets to make the calls. He's the boss. That's what Lord literally means, the boss. He is our creator, and as such, he gets to say, and rightfully so, how his creation ought to live. The second important thing to know about God is that God is holy, and this is something that we can absolutely praise him for. He is perfect. He is unlike anyone or anything that has ever been or that ever will come. He is the unstained perfect one the unstained perfect one that calls us to live in that same light. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also should be holy in all your conduct. Since it is is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. But we all know what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Eve ate the fruit, she gave it to Adam, Adam ate the fruit, and then a whole mess (laughs) have ensued after that, right? We are not holy. We are sinful. And because we're sinful, the third important thing to know is that God is just. The Bible calls him a righteous judge. And I think that sometimes we're so tempted to want to push away God's justice and not talk about it and think that it's an icky thing and it doesn't make us feel very good to talk about the fact that he's just but we have to love God's justice. We all love a righteous judge, right? We hate when we hear of a corrupt judge who perverts justice. God is perfectly just, and in his justice, he has to make a payment for sin. There has to be punishment for sin. But then we get to the most beautiful and exciting portion of this. The fourth character quality of God is that God is love. And we read in Romans 5, 8 that God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, while we were disobedient for him, Christ died for us. And the most incredible thing to think about is that where Mary is standing at this point in history, she is about to watch the greatest, most miraculous display of love to the world that has ever been or that ever will be. 
because God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, was going to take on human flesh, be born of a young, probably pimply-faced teenage girl into a poor carpenter's family, into a nondescript village. Why? because he loves us and because he wanted to make a way. He wanted to make right the holiness and the justice that he requires. So he did it himself. He took on human flesh, was born of Mary in the manger. One of the most important parts about Christmas is that we not let our gaze stop at the manger. It was incredible. It was amazing that moment that we celebrate at Christmas that Jesus Christ is born. But we can't let our gaze stop at the manger. We have to look up and see the cross. We have to look up and remember what it was that Jesus was coming to do, that his story didn't stop at the manger. He went on to live the perfect life that you and I can't live. He went on to die the death that we deserve to die. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. He loved us, and so he sent his son. And Mary was about to watch that entire event unfold before her very eyes. Mary knew who God was, and we see that in her Magnificat. We see it in her her overwhelming song of praise that she's able to talk about his character and who he is and his faithfulness to the past generations and her excitement to see what he's going to do in the future. We need to know God as intimately as Mary so that we too can respond, I am the Lord's slave. Let it be to me according to your will. So if you've never done that before, if you've never bowed your knee, if you've never fallen on your knees and repented of your sin and placed your trust in Christ, that's how you become a Christian. That's how Jesus' perfect life and death gets credited to your account so that the holiness and justice of God is satisfied in Jesus Christ. Then we know his perfect love. We know his perfect love that casts out fear. We know that we can stand before him one day and not be afraid of condemnation because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is such an exciting thing. Mary knew, Mary knew these things were coming. Mary knew who God was and she trusted him. And so her immediate response was, I am the Lord's slave. If you've never said that to our creator, holy, just, loving God, let this Christmas season be the season that you do that. Let this Christmas season be the season that you proclaim, I am the Lord's slave. If you are a Christian here today and you have said those words, then I pray that we would not lose the wonder and the beauty of having a heart like Mary all year long, not just at Christmas time, but all throughout the year. That as we lay our head on the pillow and open our eyes every morning, that that would be our first response every morning. I am the Lord's slave. Let it be to me as he sees fit. When I come to his word in the morning, let me be eager to do all that he says. Let me respond with a quick, yes, dad, because he's my heavenly father and because he's good and perfect and holy and so kind. I think that it's such an exciting thing to realize that we can have a heart like Mary. We don't need to hold her up as someone that she wasn't, but we, need to re- we can honor and be excited that she was blessed among women. No other woman in all of history got to experience what she got to experience, carry the Messiah. That is a radical assignment from God. And so we can join her in saying she is blessed among women. But we can't hold her up too high that we don't think that we can follow her example or be just like her. So... Let's be like Mary this Christmas season and say the words that she said, opening in her Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much that you loved us enough to step down from heaven's throne 
and come and be born in a stable. That God, we see in Philippians that you humbled yourself to take on human flesh, that you could live and die as our substitute. And God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who doesn't know the sweet forgiveness of Jesus, that they would turn from their sin and place their trust in Christ. God, I pray that we would all have a heart like Mary, that we would be eager and willing to quickly obey all it is that you ask us to do, not just at Christmas, but all year long. Thank you, God, for this sweet time together. Um, I pray that our visitors will come back and check out all of the fun things that we have going on and that they would, all of us would be eager to learn more about you all year. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.